Welcome back to Asian Theater. Today we're going to take on a new topic. In the past few weeks we've been focusing almost primarily on the elite arts of China, the arts that were celebrated by the nobility and by the Confucian scholars. Today we're going to look at the popular art of theater and how it stayed in the margins of Chinese culture for so long. Other in celebrated performers were court jesters who lived on the margins of, of court elite life. They could say and do things that ordinary people were forbidden to say and do. They often did antics and jokes and provided humor um, for court entertainments and were usually in this sort of ridiculous guises. Here are some ceramic figurines that were put in tombs. So these would have been symbols of prosperity and good luck and good fortune that people wanted to carry with them into the afterlife. Another kind of theater developed in the around the margins of Chinese society, which was Qi, the Chinese shadow puppets. These are quite different in design and character from the puppets we saw in Java. And so I point them out. They're much finer, they're smaller, they're finely cut, and they're translucent, meaning when you hold them up to the screen, the colors come through. Now, the history of the origins of Chinese shadow puppets is a bit of a mystery. There are legends that go back all the way to Emperor Wu when someone uh, c commanded the to bring back, was commanded to bring back the spirit of the emperor's favorite concub concubine. And there's a sort of a suggestion in the story that some kind of shadow puppetry was involved. We do know that during the Tang Dynasty, Buddhist performances were done. It's a way of kind of moving through the countryside and uh, communicating stories about Buddhism through shadow puppetry. The real traditions as we know today merge out of the Ming and the Qing dynasties, which are much later in our chronology, sort of Ming following the Yuan dynasty. There's an upsurge in interest in theatrical performances and we start to see these historic romances and more complicated warrior stories being told with shadow puppets. Here's an example of two of the puppets. You can see the way they're controlled is a single rod, wire rod that holds to the neck. And then there may be other limbs that are articulated by finer wires. Notice how intricately cut the faces are and so that they are translucent, you can see the kind of jointed mechanism that allows them to walk and move and dance. Most of the shadow puppets come from the interior region of China, a rural area where the puppetry troops are itinerant and travel among the villages and perform on special holiday occasions. Perhaps the most celebrated of all theater traditions is Beijing opera, or Shichu as it's commonly called today. Beijing opera is an amalgam of theater traditions that came together during the Qing dynasty at the bequest of the Qianlong Emperor's 80th birthday celebration. In 1790, he commanded that all the best theater companies in the country come together and give him a month-long birthday celebration. As the performers gather together in the Forbidden City, they learn from each other, and they decided instead of performing individual acts from their various repertoires, that they would combine their talents and choose the best of what they did and therefore create this ultimate theater experience for the emperor. This really boosted their visibility. And afterwards, they would return to their respective regions, carrying with them the skills and ideas they had learned from this birthday event. And this created what became known as Beijing Opera, Shichu, this 
theater of the capital, the theater that was sort of cultivated from this time when these various regional styles sort of came together for a brief event. This style has continued to evolve and grow over the centuries and has become one of the most celebrated theater forms in China today. Here we see a typical performers in the Beijing opera today. These are what we call Wen characters, domestic characters. You notice they have these bright white silk sleeves that are folded in three parts across their forearms. These are used, as you see here, for expressive gestures, such as imitated the idea of weeping or crying or concern or exasperation. They might be flung out. Mostly they're used with a kind of dance-like grace. They drop them down and then delicately flip them back onto their forearms. The movement of water sleeves is part of the sort of elegant and graceful elements of these domestic characters, characters who live in the interior of the world and they're primarily singing and speaking uh, in a kind of high poetic language. Here we see a female character called the Dan Roll and the young romantic character, the Sheng. With domestic characters called Wen, there are also the opposite of Wen called Wu, or military characters, who are acrobatic. And here we have a Wu Den, a female role type who is a military fighter. With Wu characters, you will not find them wearing water sleeves. And very often they carry a much tighter fitting costume that allows them better mobility in these acrobatic moves. Another popular character is the Cho character or comic character. And the comic character typically has this sort of spot of white uh, face paint right in the middle of their face. It can be a square, as you see over here, in a Wen Chao, or in this other guy doing this crazy acrobatic move with a bowl on his head. You can see the way in which they are there to make fun and humor in their antics. Lastly, the most important character is these large male characters who represent gods and deities and emperors and powerful leaders. And generals, they are the Jing characters with their brilliantly painted faces. The painted faces are very striking and, and have a very distinctive characteristics that telegraph their character, the actor playing the character, and their personality. Jing faces are set down by tradition, but depending on the popularity of the actor, they may change or alter the design to suit their own personal interpretation of the character. Finally, there are certain conventions and ideas about the designs that make it possible to read the meaning of the character despite never having seen that particular design before. For example, Jing color symbolism. We see that there are, there are perfect characters, I'll show you in a moment, who are symmetrical and have a minimum of colors or one solid color. These um, tend to represent upstanding and proper characters with a certain noble bearing. Asymmetrical characters, of course, represent something with bad intentions. And you see an example here of an asymmetrical character also has broken lines across his face, which means he has a hot temper. If there is uh, white faces with small black lines, we also see that they are traitors. So this particular character here, Shi Tian Yan Wang, in Cha Pa Quan, you see that is the name of the actor in this particular role. And so we can see that this face would be how that particular actor interpreted the role. Perfect faces, as you see here, have a predominant solid color. And there you can see the color symbolism. So in this case, we have a purple face which would be quiet and grave, and uh, yellow would be tricky and deceptive, and uh, black, bluntly courageous. 
These are the, the, the symbolism allows the faces to be read at a great distance and these characters to sort of telegraph their personalities across um, the open courtyard theater. Theater design in Beijing Opera was basically an open platform. There would be two doors, one on the left and one on the right. And the actors always entered from the left, circled around, played their scene and exited on the raft. There was always a sort of swift circular action in the movement. Interestingly enough, above the door on the left, which, said, which was for the entrances, there is a little sign that says exit. And above the door on the right, where the characters would leave, there is a sign that would say enter. The meaning here has been explained to me is that characters are exiting the real world as they enter the stage and they are entering into the sort of fictive world of imagination and ancient history. And when they leave the stage through, they see that where it says enter, they are returning to the real world. Mei Lan Fa was perhaps the most celebrated of all performers of Beijing opera. He was an international celebrity who traveled the world on many occasions and everywhere he went, he was sold out audiences and he became a favorite of the audiences across the United States and Europe. Mei Lan Fang also was well known in China where he played and specialized in the female role type. And here you can see him playing the, in his, his classic makeup. Mei Lan Fang, as a man, was how the tradition was performed for hundreds of years. Women were not allowed on stage and men played all the female role types. Now, if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that all of the characters I showed you in contemporary China are played by women. This is due to Mei Lan Fang, for the most part, who, recognizing that Beijing opera needed to change, made a concerted effort, effort to train women, including his own daughter, to take on women's roles and saw to it that this transition took place before he retired and passed away in 1961. One of the most celebrated of stories that is performed in the Beijing opera is the fanciful Journey to the West, which is based on the novel by Wu Cheng'an. This novel uh, is actually a kind of fictive retelling of the famous story of the arrival of Xuan Sang, the monk who traveled from China all the way to India to bring back Buddhist teachings. We talked about him a long time ago in our section on India. Well, in China, his story is legendary and became attached to all kinds of fanciful legends where the monk now called Tripitaka goes on this journey accompanied by these four mythical characters. One is the horse, which is actually a dragon. There's the monkey and there's the pig. And then there is this cannibal, all of them inveterate sinners and under terrible um, punishment by uh, Guan Yin who, uh, for their, their terrible misdeeds. And so as a sort of penance, these sinners have been sent with the monk to help him retrieve these teachings of Buddha and bring them back to China. This makes for a very exciting story and rollicking adventures along the way, all of the demons that they face and fight off and before they can eventually reach and, and retrieve the teachings of Buddha. One of the most popular characters in the Journey to the West is the Monkey King. And here's how he appears in Beijing Opera. Now you'll notice that on the left, he has a very different kind of costume than he does on the right. He also has slightly different face paint. Now this would be in the character of the Jing role. 
Now on the right, this is the monkey king when he's on the journey to the west with the monk Tripitaka. And on the right, this is when he is a king in his own domain, the king of the, of the monkeys. And there he's wearing his uh, royal robes and you can see he has uh, the water sleeves included with these giant feathers, these phoenix feathers. So this is sort of him as a domestic character. So the face paint changes depending on the story, depending on the actor playing the role, and depending on this sort of interpretation of the personality of the monkey king. Here's some other variations of the monkey king. I have a link to a performer doing um, the monkey king role. I highly recommend you take a look at it. You'll see the extraordinary ac acrobatic grace of Beijing opera performers.